For some footballers, it's been a difficult season. Mason Mount has hardly enhanced his reputation so far at Manchester United. Calvin Phillips has positively taken a sledgehammer to his since joining West Ham on loan. Sandro Tonali has gone suspiciously quiet following a bright start at Newcastle, for some reason. Things could definitely have gone better for Paul Pogba, and Quincy Promise has had what can only be described as a nightmare campaign. Yeah, that's never ideal. Those are just some careers which are at great risk, or indeed, have already gone down the pan this season, but the focus of today's video is on the precise opposite. That is to say, footballers who were probably drinking at their last chance saloon coming into this season, where, if they failed to impress, it was probably game over for them, at least at the highest level. I'm not just talking about players like Dominic Solanke, Leon Bailey, or Richarlison, who have simply been much better this season than last, or Gorka Gorazeta, who has gone from having people doubt his top flight credentials in La Liga last season, to being Athletic Bilbao's talisman, and surely in contention to win a call-up for Spain this season, Denis Undav, who could hardly buy a goal in the Premier League at Brighton last season, but has scored a quite incredible 15 goals in 23 Bundesliga games on loan at Stuttgart this season, earning a first call-up and cap for Julian Nagelsmann's Germany team, and Georges Kevin and Kudu, who was useless at Tottenham, Burnley and Monaco, without being unkind, and not much better at Besiktas, but who has managed to save his career by joining a club with a 5,000-seater stadium in Saudi Arabia, where he has so far scored 15 goals in 25 games, giving him a better goals per game record in the Saudi Pro League than Karim Benzema, Riyad Mahrez, and Sadio Mane. No, even they won't cut the mustard. Nor will Cole Palmer's remarkable flourishing at Chelsea, purely by virtue of the fact that he's so young, so can hardly be described as having saved his career, which is only just getting started. Evis Basuma, who has been much improved this season, but was only getting started last season at Spurs. Or Ivan Tony, who, admittedly, made a slow start to the campaign under a bit of a shadow, but I'm not sure that anyone thought that his gambling ban would spell the end for the Brentford man, even if he has bounced back quicker than many anticipated. I want players who were being written off, or as good as, as being dead and buried coming into this season, a bit like, say, Anthony Martial, but... Unlike Anthony Martial, they have defied all of the doubters to enjoy tremendous seasons and putting their careers well and truly back on track. As I say, unlike Anthony Martial. Without further ado then, who, I am sorry to report, has been unable to do anything of the kind this season, though we wish him all the best as always, here are seven footballers who saved their careers this season. Seventh, Christian Pulisic. It seems ridiculous that a 25-year-old, which is still all that Christian Pulisic is, was being written off coming into this season, yet that was the case, and not entirely without justification. The case against Pulisic, who set Chelsea back £58 million in 2019, and arrived at Stamford Bridge being labelled as Eden Hazard's replacement, was that, though only 25, he had pretty much regressed throughout each of his four seasons playing in England. That is reflected in Pulisic's output during his time at the bridge, in which he peaked, with 21 goal contributions in all competitions during his debut campaign, before declining almost season upon season, firstly to 10, then 13, and finally just three goal contributions, and only one actual goal, across 30 appearances last season. Of course, injuries didn't help Pulisic, most notably his repeated muscle injuries, throughout the second half of 2020, which began, in the FA Cup final to be specific, when Pulisic was playing his best football in a blue shirt. The degree to which Pulisic's stock had fallen last summer, despite the fact that he only now ought to be coming into his prime, was illustrated by the fact that AC Milan only paid 20 million euros to sign him, with 2 million euros in future add-ons, less than a third of what Chelsea paid back in 2019. If you are struggling at Chelsea, however, there would appear to be no better career move than heading to Serie A. And so it proved for Pulisic. Since inheriting Zlatan Ibrahimovic's vacated number 11 shirt following the Swedes' retirement, Pulisic has produced form almost worthy of the man himself. 
In 41 appearances, having only missed two games all season for injury, the American has made 21 goal contributions, already equaling his previous best ever tally from his first season at Chelsea, with at least nine games still to go. In Serie A alone, Pulisic has made 16 goal contributions from 26 starts, putting him firmly among the most productive and impressive wide players in the division. According to Transfermarkt, Pulisic's market value has already risen to 32 million euros, but even that feels low for someone in such fine form, still aged only 25, and with the marketability of still being the most high-profile American in the sport. It's always worth remembering that Pulisic has had to carry that burden, somewhat ironically, like friend of the channel Freddie Adu before him, of being the great hope of American football or soccer since really about the age of 15 or 16. We have seen so many players, understandably, blow up with what must feel like the weight of the world or at least a nation on their shoulders, so when you get someone like Christian Pulisic, like Martin Erdegaard, or perhaps most notably of all like Neymar, who might not fulfil the loftiest expectations that people once had of them, but still carve out tremendous careers, personally, I think that they deserve a lot of credit. The youngest player in this seven, we are seeing a more mature, intelligent, and most crucially of all, consistently fit Christian Pulisic now, and from being written off as a flop less than 12 months ago, now it feels as though the best is still to come. Sixth, Ray Manai. Who? Alright, admittedly, a bit less of a household name, a fair few of you may never have even heard of Ray Manai, but in many ways, he is the Christian Pulisic of Albanian football. That's not his nickname or anything, but allow me to explain. I say that because, like Pulisic, he left the nation of his birth at a young age, came through the academy of a club, in a country with much more football pedigree, and starred for his own country at youth team level. In Manai's case, he was born in Albania, moved to Italy at age 11, spent time in the Pacenza, Cremonese, and Sampdoria academies, and famously, or famous in Albania at least, scored 13 goals in only 9 games for Albania's under-21s. That led to a full Albania debut when Manai was still only 18, and just 12 seconds into his debut against Kosovo, Manai scored his first senior international goal. Manai's heroics for Albania's under-21s led to a whole host of clubs fighting to sign him, including the likes of Juventus, Roma, and Atletico Madrid. In the end, the teenager joined Inter Milan, where he failed to score in six appearances during his debut campaign. Three low moves followed at Serie A side Pescara, Serie B side Pisa, and Segunda Division side Granada, where Manai scored a grand total of five goals in 49 games across all three moves before joining Segunda Division side Albacete on a permanent basis. Manai was actually signed by Barcelona in 2020, or Barcelona B to be more precise, which meant a further drop down into the third tier of Spanish football. A lone move to Spezia in Serie A heralded just five goals in 30 appearances in the 2021-22 season, and last season, Manai joined Watford in the championship on a three-year deal where he scored one goal in seven games, suffered a hamstring injury, and was released after just six months. You can probably understand why then, coming into this season, now aged 27, and having scored fewer than 40 goals at club level across his entire career, even most Albanians were starting to lose hope on their former wonder kid, not least because he hadn't scored a goal for his country in two whole years, and the last two were both scored against San Marino. Some people were surprised that Turkish Super League side Sivaspor even took a chance on Manai after his seven months without a club, but this really was Manai's last chance in any kind of respectable top flight. What's more, the Super League can often be a graveyard for players who failed elsewhere, hammering the final nail into the metaphorical coffin that is their careers. Well, not for Manai. In 29 games this season for Sivaspor, who are only 10th in the Super League, Manai has scored 20 goals, averaging a goal every 100 minutes. In the league, only Mauro Icardi and Edin Dzeko, two established superstars, have scored more goals than him this season, as he has directly scored over 43% of all of Sivaspor's goals. From dead and buried to dead-eyed and firing on all cylinders, Manai is now staking a solid claim to start ahead of Armando Breuer for Albania at this summer's Euros. Fifth, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. 
Following last season, I think most people have probably written off Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, at least at the highest level, and with no great shame. Unlike Pulisic and Manai, Aubameyang had already achieved great things within the game as one of the highest scorers of the 21st century worldwide, and it's not exactly unusual to see a striker decline in their mid-30s, especially one who was as synonymous with and as reliant on pace as Aubameyang. At his peak, Aubameyang scored 40 goals in only 46 games in a single season at Borussia Dortmund, before scoring 60 goals across his first two full seasons at Arsenal, sharing the 2018-19 Premier League Golden Boot with Liverpool duo Mohamed Salah and Sadio Mane. Even after his acrimonious exit at the Emirates, Aubameyang was incredibly prolific at Barcelona, scoring 11 goals in 17 La Liga matches and 13 in 23 in all competitions. Barca needed money in 2022 though, and Chelsea, under new ownership, were keen to spend it and needed a new centre forward after letting Romelu Lukaku leave the club on loan. Chelsea paid 12 million euros for Aubameyang, handing him a two-year deal worth a reported 16 million pounds. Chelsea manager Thomas Tuchel had a good relationship with Aubameyang, owing to their time together at Borussia Dortmund, but five days after Aubameyang signed, Tuchel was sacked and replaced by Graham Potter. Potter was, well, a little bit less keen on Aubameyang, shall we just say, and later excluded him from even Chelsea's 25-man squad in the Champions League. In total, Aubameyang scored just one goal in 15 Premier League appearances at Stamford Bridge, and three goals in 21 appearances in all competitions. Given Aubameyang's age, profile, and the fact that he now had bitter endings to his time at both Arsenal and Chelsea, most people assumed that was him finished, at least in one of Europe's top five leagues. Chelsea spent the summer trying to convince him to move to Saudi Arabia, which would have confirmed that fact, but Aubameyang refused. Instead, he joined Marseille, returning to Ligue 1 10 years after leaving to join Borussia Dortmund. Marseille are a bit of a basket case, as is well established at this point, and this season has been no exception. OM have already had four different managers, currently sitting 7th in the league on table. While all may not be well, Aubameyang is a rare ray of light, having been the club's star man this season. Following just three goals in 21 games last season, Aubameyang has struck 23 times in 41 games in his debut campaign at Marseille, as well as chipping in with nine assists. The Gabon legend has averaged a goal contribution every 117 minutes in Ligue 1, in addition to becoming the all-time record goalscorer in the Europa League. It is a pretty dramatic turnaround for someone who had such a torrid time last season, and if it wasn't for him, Marseille would have been even worse than Lyon this season. Fourth, Ruben Loftus-Cheek. I promise you that not everyone in this seven used to play for Chelsea. Most, admittedly, but not everyone. Ruben Loftus-Cheek, of course, began his career with the Blues, having joined the Chelsea Academy when he was only eight years old. A man with all of the technical and physical attributes to succeed at the very highest level, few players have fitted the description of flattered to deceive better than Loftus-Cheek at Stamford Bridge. Every time that he had a great game, and it looked as though things were finally going to click, something would inevitably go wrong. Loftus-Cheek made 40 appearances for Chelsea in the 2018-19 and 2021-22 seasons, either side of low moves to Crystal Palace and Fulham, but it never felt as though he was fully embraced or guaranteed of a starting berth. Last season, Loftus-Cheek made 33 appearances for Chelsea in all competitions, though he played fewer than 2,000 minutes of football in total, as the Blues endured a miserable campaign, and he was no exception. Following 19 years at the club then, and having failed to stand out even in a dire campaign, it felt like the end of the road for Loftus-Cheek. And so it proved. AC Milan signed Loftus-Cheek for a cut price fee of just £15 million, which is about how much Chelsea adds to an agent fee if they don't get a firm yes within seven seconds. In all seriousness, it is less than a sixth of what Chelsea paid for Moises Caicedo, and roughly a quarter of what they received for Mason Mount. As I said though, if you're failing at Chelsea and you join a Serie A side, you are guaranteed, and I mean literally guaranteed to be a huge success. This was the no-brainer. This was the banker. This was the one that couldn't fail. This was one that's never failed. If you were to compare Loftus-Cheek's performances with Caicedo or Mounts this season, it would be fair to say that the 28-year-old would come out rather favourably. 
One of the standout players at the San Siro, as AC Milan sits second and are through to the quarterfinals of the Europa League, Loftus-Cheek has scored 10 goals already this season, which is five times as many as he scored in the last five seasons preceding this one combined. It's not just goals that Loftus-Cheek has contributed, he also ranks among the top 20 players in Serie A in terms of both take-ons and carries into the final third. Loftus-Cheek has always been a powerful runner with quick feet, but in a settled side where he starts most weeks and, in truth, in a league which probably better suits his style, he has been a giant in the AC Milan midfield and has got his once extremely promising career well and truly back on track. Third. João Cancelo. I'm honestly not sure whether there has been a stranger career U-turn in recent years than João Cancelo, who went from being considered certainly one of, if not literally the best fullback in the world at the beginning of the 2022-23 season, following back-to-back -back Premier League Team of the Year inclusions for the title-winning team, to being an outcast by the end of that very same season who two separate teams had turned their noses up at. No one played more games for Manchester City than Cancelo, 52 in total, as they pipped Liverpool to the Premier League title in the 2021-22 season. But following the 2022 World Cup break the following season, Cancelo found his minutes shared with Nathan Ake and Rico Lewis. Cancelo's displeasure at being dropped or rotated, however you want to put it, allegedly led to a bust-up with Pep Guardiola, who has a famously low threshold for insubordination. In what some perceived as being a power play by Pep, who is no stranger to cutting off big players who step out of line, just like Alex Ferguson did on numerous occasions at Manchester United, within days of initial rumours of discontent, Cancelo joined Bayern Munich on loan for the rest of the season, with the option of making the move permanent for 70 million euros. The whole thing seemed to happen in the blink of an eye, and there was speculation at the time that it could seriously derail Man City's season. Of course, Guardiola's men then went on to become only the second team in the entire history of English football to win a full continental treble, playing without any fullbacks in the UEFA Champions League final against Inter Milan. Cancelo, meanwhile, well, he didn't get on quite so well at Bayern Munich. Following his first three starts, he was dropped by Julian Nagelsmann, and then when Thomas Tuchel came in, he stated in a press conference that the club, quote, hadn't even discussed the possibility of making Cancelo's loan mover permanent. The speed at which Cancelo went from making World 11s to being moved on by Man City and benched by Bayern was quite remarkable, and after the latter, some wondered what might be next. As with Aubameyang, Saudi Arabia came sniffing, but Cancelo also turned down big money in the hope of proving himself on the biggest stage once again. Ultimately, another of Pep Guardiola's former clubs, Barcelona, managed to find enough money scraped down the back of Johan Laporta's sofa to sign Cancelo on loan this season, but there were still huge question marks hanging over the fullback's head. It would be fair to say that Cancelo has answered them, and in some style, as quite possibly the single most consistent and impressive performer at Barca this season, at least along with fellow former Man City star Ilkay Gundogan. He has scored four goals and made four assists in 33 appearances under Xavi so far this term, and ranks in the 90th percentile or higher among fullbacks across Europe's big five leagues in terms of expected assists, shot creating actions, progressive passes, progressive carries, successful take ons, and touches in the opposition's penalty area. It has been an emphatic response to his critics, but Barcelona might find it tough to make Cancelo's loan deal a permanent one this summer. A £34 million asking price is a little bit rich for Barca these days, especially for a 29-year-old fullback, as was indicated by Cancelo taking a reported €2 million Euro pay cut this season just to make the loan move happen. Arsenal and Chelsea, obviously Chelsea, who aren't they interested in, are also reported to be taking a look, but whilst Cancelo's destination next season remains a mystery, the fact that his career is now back in the ascendancy most assuredly is not. Second, Ross Barkley. The Premier League's poster boy in terms of rescued careers this season, things weren't looking good for Ross Barkley eight months ago, which is why, with the greatest of respect, he ended up joining Luton Town. Likened to both Gazza and Wayne Rooney in his teens, Barkley was always a prodigy at Everton, and on multiple occasions, even in the first team, it looked like that promise was going to come good. 
Barkley had some outstanding moments at Goodison Park and in an England shirt, racking up 33 caps by the age of only 25, but they were just that. Moments. Barkley never improved upon his 16 goal contributions in the 2015-16 season at Everton, back when he was only 22 years old. Some were surprised, given Barkley had struggled to live up to expectations at Everton when Chelsea signed him in 2018, but at £15 million, the Blues deemed it to be a worthwhile investment on a homegrown player who still had significant potential. It turned out to be a poor deal for all involved, but particularly for Barkley, whose reputation plunged further still and he lost his place in the England squad. After making just six Premier League appearances in his last season at Stamford Bridge, Barkley joined league side Nice on a one-year deal. It was the classic, move somewhere nice and sunny, literally nice in his case, get your career back on track as the star man, and then you'll have a whole host of options as a free agent in the summer. It didn't quite work out that way. Barkley was benched almost all season at a mid-table team in Europe's fifth-ranked league, so what hope did he have of securing a deal in the league now ranked head and shoulders above all the rest? Well, thankfully for Barkley, Luton Town, the most unlikely of championship playoff final winners, were looking for a talisman, and when no one else in the Premier League was, they were willing to take a chance on him. Unlike last season's move, Luton may not be quite as sunny or picturesque as Nice, or as well, you know, almost anywhere, but it has provided Barkley with a platform to impress as the star man, getting his career back on track. Practically an ever-present when fit this season, Barkley has already almost tripled the amount of minutes that he played all of last season at Nice, as undoubtedly the standout player at Luton, and among the most impressive midfielders in the Premier League. Mohamed Kudus, Jeremy Doku, teammate Chidozi Ogbene and Bruno Gimaraish are the only players with more successful take-ons in the Premier League this season, as Barkley ranks in the 99th percentile among midfielders in Europe's top five leagues when it comes to take-ons, the 88th percentile for expected assists, and the 93rd percentile in terms of shot creating actions. While playing for a Luton team that is in the relegation zone, those are outrageous statistics. In what has been an outrageous season and turnaround for Barkley, who deserves immense credit, as do Luton it should be said, for placing their trust in him after the last few years. First, Isco. It was always going to take something seriously special to deny Ross Barkley top spot in this seven, and Isco's performances this season have been just that. One of the most frustrating players of his generation, Isco has always had all of the ability in the world. Anyone who has watched him in full flow, at his absolute best, either live or on television, could be forgiven for wondering why this wasn't a player in frequent Ballon d'Or contention. Isco was twice nominated for the Ballon d'Or in 2017 and 2018, finishing 12th and then 29th with zero votes in 2018, but after Cristiano Ronaldo left Real Madrid, there was a real void for either Isco or Gareth Bale to step into in terms of becoming the main man for the biggest football club on the planet. Injuries always made that a task too great for Bale, but what was Isco's excuse? Mentally, he just didn't seem to be capable of inheriting that mantle because he had everything else. Flawless technique, fantastic vision, a wonderful weight of pass, and the ability to play on the left, right, or through the middle. And yet, after Ronaldo left, Isco didn't just fail to become the main man at Real Madrid, he spectacularly regressed. In the 2018-19 season, he only made six goal contributions in all competitions, a tally which he failed to improve upon in any of the four seasons which followed. In his last two years at Real Madrid, with greatly reduced game time, Isco chipped in with just two goals and three assists across nearly 50 appearances. Released in the summer of 2022, Isco joined Sevilla on a free transfer, who released him after just six months, with manager Jorge Sampaoli stating that Isco, quote, did not meet the club's expectations, end quote. Union Berlin came calling during the January window, but that deal fell through at the last minute, with both parties accusing the other one of trying to change the terms of the contract. And so, for the second half of last season, Isco just didn't have a club age 31, his career looked to be in tatters, with talk of a move to the MLS, his old club Malaga, who now play in the third tier of Spanish football, or even retirement. 
in the end, Sevilla's great rivals Real Betis offered Isco a last chance La Liga lifeline in the form of a one-year deal, which the Spaniard has clutched firmly with both hands. Absolutely magnificent this season, Isco has produced his best form in at least the last six years, if not of his entire career, including his Golden Boy winning campaign at Malaga. Back in attacking midfield, Isco has scored seven goals and made five assists in a Betis team that has only scored 36 La Liga goals all season, with the most key passes per 90 of any player in La Liga. Uncapped now in more than five years, Isco has to be in serious contention to make the Spain squad for the Euros, despite intense competition in his position, and he has deservedly already been rewarded with a fresh long-term contract at Betis until 2027. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, obviously I hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course, it goes without saying at this stage. Make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on, not just for this channel, which is about to hit 600,000 subscribers, but also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, which I'd love to get to 30,000 subscribers before the Euros. Watch this space. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or Threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, should you wish to do so. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.